Poddo. Welcome to the Netlog Radio Hour. I'm Nick Hilton. It's almost the end of 2023, a year which has seen one of the biggest technological advances of my lifetime, probably of your lifetime. Artificial intelligence, AI, has gone from being a a fringe concept, half-plucked from science fiction, to the most investable proposition on the global market. The release of products, spurred on by the springtime success of ChatGPT, has been extraordinary to witness. But it's also been scary. It's made me concerned for how we, as humans, interact with technology, and the extent to which we allow it to permeate our humanity. But more specifically, I've been concerned for how it impacts my already beleaguered industry, journalism. For those who don't know it, my day job, believe it or not, this podcast does not pay the bills, is running a company called Podo, which makes bespoke corporate and client editorial audio content. I also write as a conventional journalist about all sorts of things, particularly television. And so I've borne witness from the inside to the barrage of ill winds faced by the global media. It's why I started writing my newsletter, Future Proof, which looks at these issues. Can digital media survive the end of the advertising era? And what technologies of tomorrow could save journalism and which might destroy it? My guest for today's discussion, which looks back on 2023, which has been labelled by some, including everyone's favourite substacker, Matt Iglesias, as the media's Annus Oribilis, is Ian Silvera. Ian's a former political journalist here in the UK, but has now crossed the divide to go work for a fancy PR agency. This makes him well-placed to discuss the trends that are buffeting the industry. But Ian also writes Future News, an excellent newsletter looking at the places where innovation intersects with the media. Before we get onto that discussion, a word first from Ned to close out the year. They're off for the Christmas break and have assured me that this will be the last missive until we return in 2024. If you want to do another episode before New Year's, you will have to do it without a soundbite, they've assured me. Anyway, I asked what they thought of the state of the media as it squares off with the existential threat of AI. Will AI wipe hacks like me off the earth? Or could it actually be a tool? They wrote back the following. The difference between a tool and a weapon is its application. Think of a hammer. You design a hammer to propel nails into wood. 999 times out of 1,000, that's what it's used for. Bash, 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 nails in wood over and over. In that sense, it's a tool. But then, one time in a 1,000, it's used to bash an old lady over the head and steal her life savings. Does that mean it's no longer a tool? Is it now a weapon? The argument would follow that it is both. Usually it's a tool, occasionally it's a weapon. But once we know that a hammer can not only impact nails into wood, but also do in old ladies the nature of the tool is changed. It is never truly a tool again. And when law and order dissolves at the end of the world and looters and rioters flood the streets, do you think the millions of hammers in global homes will remain tools, will sit there waiting for nails? Or do you think their latent capacity to smash in skulls will come to the fore? At the evening of the world, you cannot be both a tool and a weapon. A tool is just a weapon waiting to be used. Okay, well, let's put that elliptical metaphor aside for now, because the discussion you're about to hear with Ian is wide-ranging and far from exclusively focused on artificial intelligence. As I've said from the outset with this podcast, we shouldn't just think about the, the latest glossy technology, but about all technology in the world. I'm writing this on a train with my MacBook in my lap, and I'm recording it later in the study in my house using a sure microphone. Things that would be unthinkable even a few decades ago. The ability to create and consume journalism has never been more ubiquitous, never been easier. And so why does everyone seem to think it's dying? Let's hope that Ian can give us some of the answers. Here's the conversation. So Ian, it's been another year and this is a year that I've seen a lot of analysis now at the end of the year where it's being described as an annus horribilis. It's been another kind of brutal, bruising year for the media, not just in audio, which is my industry, but like in print media or in TV and digital media, you you write a newsletter that deals with all of these stuff. What's your kind of overarching impression of the year that's just been? I'm a lot more positive than others, Nick, in the sense of we've seen some good innovations and people thinking about uh, their strategy around news media a lot more deeply 
And now that we've gotten to know Web 2.0, so-called, and obviously with Web 3.0 on, on the sort of horizon, I think people are delivering content better. There's a higher level of professionalism. And there's a sort of roadmap now for news media companies, particularly when it comes to some of the big social media platforms. They're very afraid with them. And we can get into that a bit uh, more. Obviously, we've seen at the start of the year, around March, uh, chat GPT, you know, rocket out of nowhere, really, from uh, OpenAI. And we've already seen that change, dramatically change in many ways, the industry, the content that it can create, you know, at a click of a finger. And there's been various studies as well about the population of some news websites and other websites, general websites with AI content. So I think that's one of the big markers of this year. It's the, it's the rise of AI. Going back to your point about, you know, the media at large and the sort of ad market as well. Obviously, it's been a tough time in the wider macroeconomic climate. So it's no surprise that I've been a slew of sort of layoffs, uh, people repositioning their companies. And obviously, those ad revenues being cut because usually, unfortunately, and in my day job as well, marketing sometimes can be the first thing to be cut uh, beyond anything else, particularly when it comes to more uh, operational minded business lines. So yes, and I was just reading a report coming into this, there's been at least 2,000, more than 2,500 jobs uh, gone in the journalism industry just in the US. So I imagine globally, we're talking at least the tens of thousands. So yes, a tough year, but I think there are some green shoots there, particularly as we look into 2024. And I think there are some positive things that we can touch upon a, a bit later into this. Okay, well, let's let's cycle back to what you first said, which is that you're positivity about the year that's been comes to some extent from the fact that you think there's been a number of innovations. Now you've you've talked about ChatGPT, but what are the particular kind of news media focused innovations that have kind of got you going, got your motor running this year? Yeah, one of the things that um I'm quite proud of, I suppose, is it sounds a bit weird, but as a British person, it's great to see a bit of entrepreneurial flair. And one of the interviews that I did early in the year was with Screenshot Media. They've been around a couple of years. And really, they're teaching the rest of the industry, quite frankly, and all the companies how to how to deal with Gen Z and mm-hmm. interact with Gen Z. But they're a very sophisticated way of looking at social media. And it's not just lumping different pieces of content across platforms. It's actually giving the time and respect to each platform, understanding the riffs, the layouts, the, the different people and how they re- uh, react to the content, and then creating it accordingly. So a good example would be, say, like Instagram, obviously very ho- photo-driven, and then TikTok short videos. But what we've seen bad from the news industry in the past is that they've just recycled content across it. What Screenshot Media are doing very well is that tailored approach. And um, they've got you know millions and millions of views off the back of it and they're growing. We've seen this a little bit as well with Lad Bible Group as well. I would point to their sort of mm-hmm. uh, success. They're doing a bit of a further uh, launch in the US as well. I believe they've acquired a company over there. And, and, and same thing. So this is really positive. Two British media brands there have got it dead on. Um, another one that I would point out, more on the negative side, obviously we've seen a bit of rejigging around Newsnight. Perennially, it seems, you know, is this flagship current affairs show for the BBC going to be staying there? I thought it was terribly disappointing uh, a number of years ago when they closed the dedicated YouTube channel for Newsnight. Because quite frankly, we're seeing this year on YouTube, people are lapping up long form, analytical and and really high quality journalism on that platform. Still has to prove itself, wash its face. But if you have upstart companies on there, eventually get into the millions of users or even hundreds of thousands of, uh, of viewers, um, I believe it can very much more than wash its face and become incredibly profitable. So that gives you a slice of some of the things that have been going on. With regards to AI, I think some news brands have uh, adapted really quickly and their transparency has been fabulous. One of the ones that I would point to is Coindesk, which is obviously covering the web free and crypto space. And as you can imagine, as someone on the sort of frontier of technology, they were well on top of this and they're one of the first to publish an AI strategy. And it's quite extensive. Um, the Guardian have done their own. There are other news, news publications. 
But I would really point their strategy out really as a creme de, creme de la creme uh, for others in the industry to look at. And not just in the news industry, but others who are obviously thinking about the rise of AI and how to deal with it. I want to pick up a couple of threads from that. The first one would be to to cycle back to what you were saying about um, social media, you know, your learnings from screenshot, etc. I speak to a lot of people in magazine journalism and newspaper journalism, and it seems like the prevailing sense this year has been that social media has started to work against journalism and there's much greater friction. For a long time, you've had this sort of journalism base and the social media has been a way of directing traffic towards that base and they know how to how to monetize that base. Now, the trend at both very obviously at Twitter, but also at Facebook, Meta, Instagram, has been to make it harder to redirect traffic from social media to traditional media, which is pushing more and more brands to do what you're talking about, which is integrated journalism directly onto social media. What sense do you have of like the way that social media and journalism is evolving? And is there a way that brands can better monetize and exploit these opportunities in sort of native social media journalism? Yeah, so our, our impact this is a few things and it goes into the business models of the brands themselves. But I would say a good example and perhaps a bit of a controversial one, and we've just seen Mr. Nigel Farage come out of the jungle. Yeah. GB News, I think, is doing a fabulous job across social media. They're putting YouTube up and Twitter. They even have a sort of in-house um, sort of coordinator you get a behind the scenes glimpse it's sort of like what bar sort of done very well actually mm -hmm. over in the us as a sports media brand but now they're doing this for their gb news users and really they're 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 driving value and also that community spirit but then it's not giving the goods away and i think this is what you know friendly i remember when i was you know a full-time journalist um, we always found Twitter or X as it's known, the engagement rates were low compared to Facebook. And the Facebook was the best place to put your um, news article and follow through with hyperlinks. We've also seen the changes earlier this year with, on X where they're not showing um, the, the sort of imagery uh, anymore. Sorry, the headlines in the imagery. But I tell you what, FT, they do their own bespoke sort of thumbnails almost. And Substack, which my um, newsletter is on, I know yours is as well, we're really quick to move on this. But I'm still, to this day, I'm still seeing major, major news brands just using Getty stock images and do more, no, uh, no more than that. So I'm sorry, I think they need to think more carefully about their social media strategies and things like this. And it's not just pushing content out there. It's thinking about different things like this and creating more bespoke elements like the FT. But this is this is a point. Where are we going to, Nick? And I think it's where Chris Williams of The Telegraph told me a number of years ago, we're getting driven towards quality. This is what people are willing to pay for. And why I said it goes back to the business models, um, we're still seeing a rise of the smaller, leaner. I call them journalism as a service. You get software as a service. This is journalism as a service. So these are uh, smaller publications with deep niches. You know, uh, Politico have, have shown us the model back in the day. And obviously, many people from there have left. So Axios, you get Punchbowl, similar model, a few places popping up over here. So, yes, I think the figures also show what some of people in the industry have told you, which is to say, um, both from Ofcom and Reuters, digital journalism, that people are actually turning away from news. And it's only about 11% number of consumers are actively seeking articles or going straight to the source, which is bad. Um, but I still think there's an awful lot of work to be done um, in the industry. And I would like to praise, obviously, he moved away early in the year from um, uh, News Corp, but obviously, well, he still has an involvement, obviously, to an extent. But Rupert Murdoch, many years ago, when he put the Times behind the paywall, you know, decade, that's more than a decade ago, and that yeah. was entirely the right thing to do. And I think that's it. You've got to keep your discipline. Don't, don't give your good stuff away. Use the social media to sort of advertise yourselves, get a bit of content out there. If you can wash your face through the social media, whether that's um, you know driving um, 
sort of revenue to another stream or merchandise as many YouTubers do, by way of example, that's fantastic. But otherwise, you've got to have this strong discipline. And really, I think in totality, Nick, we are still going through this long process of this uh, this drive towards quality. And unfortunately, I think we will see more brands topple over because they're not able to deliver what people really want. Mm. Yeah, it's a curious one. I guess this this sort of long established, this sort of fragile truce, the symbiosis between journalism and social media it has definitely been eroded this year. I mean, I, and I, and that's not just it's not just the door of Elon Musk, who obviously doesn't really like journalists, has had a really fraught relationship with them, especially in the in the recent year. Because I, I do speak to people who work specifically on social media for news brands, and they say that they have noticed algorithmic trends that want to push people away from content that contains links. And for instance, they're trying to sort of, you know, gerrymander the links into content without explicitly putting links because they know that they will be depressed. And it makes sense if you're if you're Facebook or, or Twitter, that you want to keep people on the platform for as long as possible, make them see as many adverts as possible. And that means basically every time they click on some sort of interesting journalism and go away from it, you know, that's time away from your, your platform. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult one. We're still working it out. And I think that for a long time, news media has been overly reliant on social media as a way of driving audiences. I would say, Nick, I think there's been a bit of naivety in the industry. Listen, this is their businesses, news media is businesses. Yeah. And these are businesses. And I think the main reason as you say, they're algorithmically, they're moving away from news because it's not, they don't see that much money in it. There's mm -hmm. more money in entertainment. Listen, the biggest media uh, sector there is now is gaming, right? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're a business. And I, I still hear this sort of naivety. And I was around back in the day when Facebook were going around and trying to drive people through incentives to video. And we all know what happened there, the pivot to video, which never happened, which funny, I'm actually seeing this year more and last year there's there's a pivot back but in a more sustainable way yeah and it's literally you know i feel for the people who are directly sort of implementing these social media policies but ultimately it's for their bosses as businesses to say we've got to back ourselves we've got to grow a sustainable business here and i would say for individual journalists themselves great that you're advertising your work particularly on x slash twitter uh, we've seen that for years and it's become a bit of a portfolio and you're interacting with other journalists. But quite frankly, is that going to drive clicks ultimately to your uh, stories? And quite frankly, is that going to make money for your organization? And I would say, you know, ultimately, unless you're a rare example, it's probably going to be no. So you need to look at other things such as events i mentioned merchandise i know yourself nick you're across a foray of different things and i suppose it is sad but at least now everyone knows you cannot rely on social media anymore you, you you've you you can build a brand in the right way you have to be fully dedicated to it it can't be an afterthought you know again i'll mention barstool as a sports brand they've built that really on youtube the modern day barstool um so it's just the way that they they look at it. And yeah, I think, you know, going into next year now, at least people will be atop, atop of this issue and really think about, right, how are we going to drive value to our readership and how do we get them? And it's probably through loyalty and it's probably through more niches and the like. Um, so an example of a publication that's going to launch in uh, Q1, they're being a little bit vague about it and I don't want to give too much away for them, is Digital Frontier. And this is the same thing. So they've seen sifted, uh, they've seen others in the in the space, you know, concentrate a bit on crypto, web free, fintech, and they're like, right, we're going to launch. I think they've got a team of more than six uh, editorial staff, and this is it. They're going to going to go deep, and it's going to probably going to be a subscription behind it. That's TBC, but this is probably the way forward. Yeah, I mean, you're touching upon, I guess, a big theme for me from the past year, which has been this, you know, you talk about this kind of rise in sort of quality niche publications, rather than basically big news brands that are trying to do everything. You also reference there the fact that, you know, creators, whether they're on YouTube or podcasts, or whatever, are doing more and more direct sales. And obviously, part of that is being like, buy my hoodie. But also part of that is saying, look, I'm, I've got a Substack, pay five quid you know, and, and you'll get this monthly email. 
it's difficult for me to see that as like a really long term sustainable model. Um, I just think it, it's too atomized. People are getting too little for too much at, at, at the moment. You know, a five pounds for a, what is essentially a weekly column on Substack. I mean, it, it makes newspapers seem like really tremendously good value. Do you think that that model is sustainable, though? Because, I mean, it seems to be the only good idea that the media has kind of come up with is to pack a bunch of the unemployed journalists off and allow them to try and raise a bit of money off their own back. Yeah, I mean, I think just like any free market, it will sort itself out to an extent. The extent I would, uh, I would obviously highlight there. Yeah, I think, you know, we have seen that massive rise, but they're all, you know, they're private enterprises and we will, maybe some of them will grow even more and some of them will fall away. I mean, how I see the landscape at large is that I think we're going to have probably about three or four, you know, go ahead, massive global news brands. I think New York Times would be up there, obviously, as an obvious one. I think The Guardian is going to be up there. On the business side, you know, FT will continue to be there, Bloomberg, um, and then to an extent, uh, CNBC, right? And then you go further down. So then if you think more nationally, I think that you're going to see the same thing. It will be four or five big news brands. And then at that level, or I suppose globally as well, it's the trends and sectors. So in our game, quite frankly, you know, uh, futurism and media, I think you would be silly not to subscribe to Benedict, uh, not to subscribe to Benedict Evans's newsletter, right? And there's a number of others, um, Ben Thompson's newsletter as well, right? So there you find yourself, oh, I've got to be across about maybe three or four max newsletters. And that's how I sort of see the more sophisticated news users. If you look at the facts and figures, most people, Joe Blow's, Joe Blog's consumer, excuse me, they're only subscribing to two at most. If it's through work, they've got work subscriptions. So that's that that's the landscape as I see it. And then going back to your point, really, Nick, is that yeah, I think a lot of these will will drop off. And it depends. I mean, obviously, one of the biggest ones on Substack is all about American history in the in the Trump era. We've seen Trump come back, so that's probably going to get bigger again. And um, some of them will will fall away, but I know you. I know you're very you're very <laughs> take a very free market approach to these things. I'm sort of always a bit like a bit like ideological about the necessity for sort of providing a sustainable news media, and I sort of don't particularly trust the free market to do a, do a particularly benign job of this task. But um, well, I, I, I do think I agree with Paul Staines of um, Guido Fort's blog on this. He told me many years ago, and he actually uh, prophesizes this or sort of. So talks to this quite a lot online is that the best model for news media is profitability that's it and you can do great journalism if it's profitable you know how many times have we seen on x people you know sharing a free amazing article or people saying oh that should be free because no well how is it paid for how is a deep dive investigative yeah. piece of journalism with six months paid for you've got it's got to be prof- i mean that's getting to the public service stuff right i think you know, the BBC has sort of gone from one issue to another throughout the year. I actually, f- I've, you, you've probably read my pieces basically in short saying BBC has gone from, a, you know, it's in a rock to hard place. I think it's a little bit silly, frankly, from the government not to give that funding for the World Service, which I f- think is fantastic for the UK. Um, uh, fantastic for the UK from a soft diplomatic point of view and the journalism is great but I also think we've got to have a conversation about what type of public service journalism and media we want namely around the BBC and what its output is I think they've done great great things partnering with regional regional um, local news brands such as Reach as others and doing the political democracy uh, reporters, democracy reporters, sorry, and also um, other initiatives like that. But I think the other thing, and catching up with a colleague who used to be at one of the largest newswires in the world, we were having a good chat the other day all about the demise of court reporters. Mm-hmm. You know, you get a few wire services now um, in the high courts in, in, in London. You may have someone from Reuters or PA Media and then occasionally, only occasionally, maybe Evening Standard's got someone down there. That's that's it. 
And that's, you know, as you were talking about democratic accountability and other elements, you know, that that's what scares me. So I think as a society, we should be thinking about this type of thing. And I would actually like maybe through the license free model that they think about uh, court reporting and other elements, they thought about local democracy. And I think, you know, the other side, bringing it back to that for enterprise stuff, I know we've had conversations in the past about sort of the BBC stance uh, and encroaching on, you know, uh, podcasts. You know, do they, you know, do they need to bring their almighty massive battleship onto the, the frontier of this? And I, I I would say strategically, you know, what's the value you know, there is obviously some value with doing some podcasts, but that the way they've done it, and obviously I think independent um, podcasters um, are suffering because of their moves. And I would say as well, it's really interesting, I thought, um, Gary Lineker seems to be in hot water again. <laughs> it's a day of the week with regards to his tweeting, right? But I just think it's remarkable that we've got this, uh, the BBC excuse me, and us as licence fee payers, have this deal with Gary Lineker, to which he gets £1.3 million per year, right? But we don't have exclusive rights on his podcasting or other new media aspects. And he's he's the co-founder, isn't he, of Go Hunger, Gold Hanger Podcasts, who are a direct competitor. I just think that's quite bizarre. So they, they really need to look at this, both from the commercial perspective of thinking about new media and where it's going, like I'm, I mentioned as as well about you know Newsnight and the fact that they mm-hmm. don't have a U- dedicated YouTube, which I think is a travesty. What we need as a nation, public public service journalistic broadcasting, and also these new models. Um, BBC Studios, looking at their annual report, is doing really well and it's growing and it's and they're making a big push into the US. They're, they're, they're um, unveiling a number of political based newsletters into the US market and that's basically BBC Studios amongst other things so it's how they can get more money doing that and the areas that they want to focus on but finally I would say obviously you know in the US you've got PBS which is funded by charities and got NPR and these are great uh, journalistic enterprises but they are nothing they, they, they pale in vast comparison to the BBC so even as someone who's politically, you know, we talked about free enterprise on the sort of economic rights of, of, of the landscape, I'm still a massive supporter of the BBC. And I think we, um, as a nation, um, should value it more than we do. But also, it does need to get us out together a little bit, think about the future. Where can it win globally? Where can it help people out of the UK? And what areas does it really need to focus on? Yeah, I could talk obviously all day about the BBC. Don't want to get drawn particularly into its its work in podcasting. Um, I think the, the the situation with Gary Lineker is really unusual. I would be, I'll say it here, just so I seem prescient when it, it inevitably happens, I would be amazed if Gary Lineker was still working for the BBC next year. I think this will be his final season on Match of the Day. I think it's becoming absolutely unsustainable, his relationship there. Oh, can we just do a little bit aside as well, Nick? You know, because obviously sure. we are reflecting on the year. Uh, a little gripe, the rise of the banter sports commentator, which is obviously, you know, being ushered in by the lovely uh, Mika Richards, who I am a fan of. But it now seems he's he settled this model, which is basically say, if you weren't that prolific of player, because obviously he is sitting by, you know, world champions, champions yeah, league, yeah, champions, yeah, yeah. etc. You can bring a bit of levity to the situation. But now it just seems to be everywhere. And... Where is the analytical deep insight element of it? I mean, I remember my late grandfather I was very close to. He used to back in the day turn off the commentary and put the radio on. So <laughs> we may get more of that. It'd inevitably be horribly out of sync now. But um, I, I always think the Guardian and the Athletic do some pr- pretty some pretty good analysis for the people who are that way minded and for the people who like the banter, who like Mika Richards' sort of screaming laugh. Yeah, why not? I do love Mika. It's just, um, you know, the clones that have popped up around or the other people who are trying to emulate right. what he does in an insincere fashion. That's the bit that I don't like. Also there, you mentioned Athletic. I thought that was really interesting earlier in the year, what New York Times have done, got rid of their sports desks, absorbed Athletic, 
Um, I think a lot of our, you know, media watchers like ourselves always thought fabulous. We heard the salaries were, you know, uh, proportionally a lot higher than anywhere else. Uh, the athletic and fabulous that sports journalism was flourishing. Obviously, they've sort of rejigged a few their things there, as you would expect after an acquisition. I think it's a fabulous publication, but I think that will maybe prove the point in the next couple of years of where this deep dive journalism goes. Maybe proves a bit of your point as well about what people are willing to pay because they've got a Disney subscription, they could have a DAZN subscription, mm-hmm. etc. You could have five different, five or six different subscriptions, and how much they want to pay for journalism, I'm not so sure. Well, well, this is where my sort of free market side comes out when I when I see like a new insurgent publication come along and they're paying like above market rate salaries above market rate price per word sort of in in journalism i'm immediately like this isn't going to last this isn't sustainable they're salting the market i hate when people inflate use venture capital money to inflate the average you know average salaries because it it, you know it doesn't last and it it leads to layoffs it leads to all sorts of of all sorts of uncertainties and i think the the athletic is is probably a bit like that i would like to see media organizations paying the absolute least that they can get away with in the market and in terms of people's living conditions because i think that's where you end up with the most sustainable media but that's you know I guess. well we know the example there don't we which is obviously buzzfeed news there's lots of pressure i remember i reported you may have read some wise pieces in 2022 you know one of these or well, before that, one of these guys going to IPO, there seemed to be a lot of pressure from the investors. Like, when are we going to get this away? Obviously, the IPO, I've just checked out their latest, latest stock price. Obviously, mm-hmm. this is um, going to be recorded and put out another time. But it's it's basically at the moment around 30 cents um, um, earlier in the month. Yeah, similar. similar. So it's knocking around 30 cents. Um, obviously, they've had a little bit of a strategic rejig um the focus on ai content as well which i think early in the year that pushed the stock price up but yeah it'd be very interesting you know if we're having this conversation next year where buzzfeed is where they fit into that landscape because they were a pioneer of so much and it's not again it's i don't think me or your good self nick you know (laughs) We take pleasure in what's happened there at all. I mean, they've had some fabulous journalists in the UK. I would point out Alex Wickham as well, right? And he's at Bloomberg now. But yeah, I, I suppose it goes back to that sustainability point. They were going around the markets many years ago. I think we all know this with the high salaries and doing fabulous things. And they just, unfortunately, um, the rest of the world caught up to them. And to an extent, you could argue, uh, argue excuse me, have overtaken them. But, you know, it's still a big company. It's got a market cap of $50 million, um, $50 million now. Never say no. <laughs> their, their current business model, which is basically go on Reddit, you know, and harvest uh, conversations for people who didn't know, don't know about the existence of Reddit. You know, it's not, I mean, it's not a great business model, but it's, you know, I've seen worse. Yeah, I get very anxious about these companies that come in and poach staff and double their salaries. And then six months later, they're being laid off. People leave really good jobs to try and take a moonshot on one of these you know overpaying startups anyway we're getting this is getting horribly distracted i've got to before we overrun i've got to ask you one final question which i know you're doing a lot of work on ai in your day job and also in future news i cannot see how the rise of chat gpt is good for journalism but i will leave it to you to offer some optimism i think some yeah optimistic thoughts is I think it's that drive towards quality. And I think it's going to be more of the sophisticated view on AI. And I think people, the news publications are already providing this transparency that it can be a bit of a research tool. I think there's a technical aspect that everyone should be aware of at the moment, which is in the literature. And it's been well covered, uh, multiple studies, even one by Google uh, DeepMind recently, which AI uh, or the specific AI, large language models, it's not good at self-criticism. Mm-hmm. That means it's very limited. And this whole rise of um, general artificial intelligence, we're way off there. I know others are saying different things, such as Jeff Hinton, who's often seen as the godfather of it. But if you look at the most recent literature, I think people want more quality, more focus on on, on this. Uh, I think the other thing it does, and the nice as- there's a nice aspect to it, it could free up some of the reporter's job, However, as you've probably seen, there are now 
news publications looking for AI um, AI powered or AI backed reporters. Right. So we're already seeing that, which I think is a bit negative. That's just con. I'd, I, to be honest, I think we're in a position now, Nick. We would definitely probably talk to these terms, but the industry there's there's content producers or content farmers. Then I think there's journalistic outlets, and that's not get confused about the two different camps, which sometimes I think people do, and I think people still want high quality journalism. That that's the fundamental aspect of it. Just drawing on what I think is going to happen coming up into the election years, election in the US, election expected in the UK election in India, just to name a few, I think 2024, this is when we really see, and we already know what it can do, but see how society reacts to AI and if there's a democratic deficit there. We've seen, obviously, the deep fakes. We've seen the the other thing as well. It's more, it's the less sophisticated aspect, but it's like pairing it with existing technologies. So we know there are news deserts, particularly in the US, there are just areas that don't have regional or local news. It's very easy for a polit- political manipulator to create a um, social media platform that looks like basically sort of like a fake website that sounds very reputable. But it's then the production of that content now, like I said earlier, it could be at a click of a finger. So it's not so much the AI itself, it's what, what it's paired with, how it's used as well. I think this is going to be the big test, particularly next year. And I think, you know, we saw in the UK, there's this whole bit about um, artificial general intelligence and the 0.01%, the frontier stuff. But I think that's wrong in the the wider strategy. I think we we should be thinking of what it's doing now and the second and third order order impacts of it, both on the news industry and wider, because it's happening now. Like, it's not this whole thing where people think Terminator is going to appear in five years. It's not that. It's already having really bad effects on society. And, yeah, I've talked about some of the positives, but I think everyone's got to get their head around that now. Like, there's no time to not think about that. And for any business, you know, it's not going away. You can't put it back in the box. I know there's a whole thing within the AI industry, actually, about slowing the technology down. But then you've got all these different bands and wasn't really the consensus around that coming out of actually, you know, Meta, interestingly, from Nick Clegg and Mark Zuckerberg are saying they're doing this more open source approach. Others aren't doing that. Others are saying that's dangerous. So there's still no consensus there. And while there's still no consensus and talk about um, the free market, it's going to carry on rolling out. So get used to it, get your heads around it and think about how this is going to impact both good and bad and try and plan accordingly. The Ned Lug Radio Hour is a Podo podcast written and presented by me, Nick Hilton. The theme music is Internet Song by Apes of the State, used with their generous permission. The artwork is by Tom Humberston. The socials go to nedlarlives.com and spread the word from there. I'll be back before Christmas with another sort of cheerful sort of essay style episode but for now that's goodbye gather around kids I'll tell you all some stories of what life was like before the internet wandered round our neighborhoods aimlessly lighting shit and fire